uh, in terms of scheduling, uh, you know, and so it's uh, that. But, but the most important issue that is actually pushing the pushing these young men and women away from primary care is financial. Yeah, I think that's very, very true because if you come out with a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, if you talk about most and not City College, and we'll talk a little bit mm -hmm. because City College is an incredibly financial bargain, um, but if you've gone through a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt from your undergraduate college, then another couple of hundred thousand dollars in debt for medical school, by the time you get out, it really is difficult in this day and age. I have um, two children who graduated from college and you understand how they struggle with how are they going to pay their bills, pay their debt and then make a kind of life like we did. You know, figure right. out how to have a family, own a home, the kinds of things that were more or less assumed in the 70s and 80s in this generation of physicians, it really is a struggle for them. Yes, and definitely. definitely. I think one of the unique things about Sophie and talk a little bit um, is we take our students in from high school. So That's talk a little bit about how you how you find those students who have this commitment to medicine so early on. So we actually have what we what is called uh, in short the BSMD program. So we take kids traditionally in order to go in order to go to medical school, you go through college and then at the end of college you apply to four years of medical school. So it's a total number of four or eight years. For us it's different. There are a number of programs like this in the country where you actually enroll kids at the end of high school and in our, in our case over seven years so you one year less than the usual you actually get a medical degree let me start by saying that I trained in Europe so this is actually the model that I mm -hmm. I, I followed so I went to medical school straight from high school and it was a six-year program so I feel very sympathetic to these young kids who are trying to uh, behave like uh, professionals at age 18 um, so and the way we, we 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 recruit mostly from 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 the city and and the outlying counties and so our our students are applicants from all different high school and uh, one of the great one of the I think the great things that we do at Sophie Davis is that we do not necessarily focus only on scores you know students know that you have to have very high scores in order to get in and in particular. In, in medical school, there is a very difficult test called the MCAT. Mm -hmm. We don't use that. Uh, we do use the uh, SAT score, the, the, the scores that high school students do, but we do not rely only on them. What we, we, what, we, what we do is what we call holistic approach. We interview these kids. We try to figure out what, what's driving them. What's driving them to make a decision? Are they really committed? Do they understand the challenges of a medical professions? Uh, so it's a, it's a really, uh, actually quite fascinating process because these kids at age 16 already have to, have, have, some of them have a very clear idea about what they want to do and their commitment is really unwavering. It's a fantastic program, and, and we're very proud of it at City College. Um, so I, I'm glad you got a chance to tell people because it's sort of a hidden jewel at City College. It's a small class. We take in, what, about 70 70 kids every year. A year. Approximately. Um, but again, these are students dedicated to primary care, and unlike the national trends of medical schools, many of our students, in fact, do end up in primary care Correct. and they're required to do service Correct. after medical school back in underserved areas. Correct. If you look at the figures, uh, uh, basically uh, between 40 and 50 percent of our graduates end up serving primary care, uh, in primary care and, and, and 45 percent of their patients are from underserved community. And even though 40 to 50 percent may not seem too high, in the medical in the medical school world is extremely high very few if none of the other medical school in the country can boast such a such a, a rate of primary care choices and we're very proud of our sophies um, can you talk about a couple of our superstars tell where some of our sophies go yeah let me, let me say first of all that they're all superstars they are they are they are all very exciting so and the fact that already that's that some of these kids uh, make it to medical school and to medical license it's already a great success they come from from backgrounds that are not traditionally the background that that 
generate medical students in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, first, first, uh, first uh, generations migrant, first generation college students. Uh, they come from part of the world who have gone through major conflicts. So it's really already that. It, it's a great success. And so we are proud of all of them. That's true. But let me give you a couple, two names I think it's uh, important. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Woodson, who actually is, is serving currently as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. He was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve in that thing. And uh, Lori Zephrin, mm -hmm. she's actually the first national director for reproductive health for the veteran affairs. So as you can see, these are prominent, prominent national figures in the healthcare system. And we have a lot of senior vice presidents. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the, chair of the, the, the chief of medicine at the University of Miami. So it's really, uh, and, and we have, a large number of unsung heroes who, who provide primary care in the trenches in the every day in, the, in, in, in New York. So, Oh, that's really, really wonderful. So thanks for talking about it. And for those of you who are out there listening, parents, students, um, you ought to look up Sophie Davis if you're in high school and you have a real passion for helping others and for primary care medicine. It is a very, very special program. Well, now let's change gears because you are a physician and you're a physician scientist um, with many, many publications in a variety of areas. You always talk, and when we talk, we see each other all the time because an interim provost and as the dean of Sophie Davis, um, we talk about issues of risk factors, environment, what are the risk factors for disease, and you're very interested in heart disease. Tell me, what is the relationship between environmental factors and heart disease? What do we know about it? We know for sure that a large percentage of the disease is attributable to exposures in the environment. And by environment, we use the broad definition. It mm -hmm. includes diet, includes lifestyle habits, includes where you live, what you breathe, the, 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 the kind of uh, 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 living situation you have. And so while there are certainly some genetic components, so far we have not been able to identify for the complex diseases like heart disease, uh, an, like a single gene. Right. So the, 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 it's most likely an interaction between environmental exposure and your individual factors, or maybe genes or other things. But definitely in heart disease, one of the most important things is diet. And diet, what you eat is very important. And uh, traditionally, the diet of, of North Americans and North European is not a very healthy diet. Uh, uh, now it's much better. But when I started to work in this field, the United States was one of the countries with the top death rates for, for coronary heart disease in, in the country, in the world. And the, 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 the disease has dropped substantially in the last 30 years. And one of the reasons why it has dropped is because the diet has improved. The serum cholesterol of Americans has dropped about 25 points oh. on average. What is a healthy serum cholesterol? Like? But, uh, according to the definition, uh, you, should not, you should have your cholesterol below 200. Okay. 200 is really the, uh, the lower the better. Right. And in, in the United States in the 50s, the average serum cholesterol of America was about 250. Oh, my goodness. And now it's about 215, 218. Okay. So the huge drop. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result of that, the United States are not one of the anymore one of the leading uh, one of the countries leading coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. Uh, high blood pressure treatment has, has played a major role, uh, and smoking cessation has played a major role. Uh, weight weight is very important because not only overweight per se, but because overweight can cause diabetes, can cause all sorts of right. metabolic derangement of glucose, insulin. And, call, and, and is one of the most important factors in what we call the metabolic syndrome with a, this cluster of, of, of risk factors that really are kind of call, even called the deadly, the deadly quartet because they mm -hmm. kind of, you know, a little bit of each can cause really a significant increase in risk in individuals. Mm -hmm. And in neighborhoods um, where there's not access to healthy fruit and vegetables, I think that's one of the things that we see in neighborhoods, underserved areas, yes. where there aren't large grocery stores where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables for a reasonable price. Anything being done about that now? Yeah, to that's, help? Very, that's very interesting because, you know, we tend to blame the individual. 
Yeah. We tend to blame sure. always the person, say, oh, you don't eat well, oh, you should do this. But we did a study in Buffalo when I was at the University of Buffalo where you, we look at zip codes. And there are certain zip codes in which, as you say, there are no supermarkets. Right. So the only, the only source of food are the corner stores. And the corner store, because of their market and their finances, they don't, they very, very limited fresh food. They only sell canned food or food prepackaged. And therefore, it's very difficult. I remember in Buffalo, there were people that would come from those neighborhood with, with, with take a, they had to take a cab in order to go to, go to a grocery store. So it needs to be, it's not just a matter of individual choice, a matter of, uh, of, of, uh, city planning and we need to we need to not only create the opportunity but incentives for people to put s grocery stores and availability of of, of uh, uh, healthy food in all the neighborhoods yeah and I think and it's and it's even more than just the healthy food it's the access to an environment that allows children to be out and playing correct and we also talk in in neighborhoods um, about when you have a lot of violence on the street a lot of youth violence gun violence Parents don't feel safe having exactly. their little kids out playing out in the streets. And so there's an interaction much more yeah. about, like you said, than the individual and what he or she it's puts in. It's very hard to tell somebody now. that they have to go for a jog. Right. If by going out for a jog, they take the chance on their life. Right. right. <laughs> so, you know, you may improve your lipids, your good lipids, but the, the overall risk. And the other thing that we yeah. saw is that, for instance, uh, availability of park-like uh, right. spaces, green space. green space, it's very important for the weight of kids. Yep. And so, you know, uh, and, and in neighborhoods where there are no, there is no availability of green space, then it becomes a challenge. So, um, thanks for that. Because I think those are the kinds of things we all have to be thinking about in general, not just the isolated, can you get this food or that? We have to be thinking holistically as we talk about in terms of the environment. Um, we're going to take a quick break, Dr. Trevisan. And for those of you out there, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be back with some more interesting facts and interesting discussion. <laughs> WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Italian cuisine in an elegant atmosphere. Grand Piazza di Oro now has a full service bar and they offer the best in Italian cuisine. Satisfy your palate with an assortment of traditional Italian dishes. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lisa Cueco, president of the City College. In the studio with us today is Dr. Maurizio Trevisan, City College's interim provost and dean of the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. Um, I'd like to continue our discussion, um, and we were talking about diet and environmental factors. Uh, speaking of diet, you were raised in Italy which is known for having a very rich diet. How do the rates of heart disease in Italy and in Europe compare to the U.S.? And what do you believe is a major reason for any of these differences? Yeah, uh, Italy has lower rates of heart disease. And you know, as a matter of fact, Italians live longer than Americans overall, like the, Greek, the Greeks do and the Spaniards do. So I was not only grew up in Italy, but I grew up in southern Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in what we call the Mediterranean basin or area. Uh, this part, Greek, Spain, Southern Italy, uh, we are characterized by a diet that is very healthy because the sources of our foods are vegetable. So we have vegetable oil, in particular olive oil. We have fruits and vegetables. We have low, traditionally, low portions of meats, very little sweets, and therefore uh, 
we are kind of blessed in a sense because it's very easy for me to have a healthy diet because I don't have to give up because I grew up when I grew up my I had meat once or twice a week yeah. you know and the the, the 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 meat portion that my mother would serve was very small so most of most of the time was was vegetables with pasta or without pasta a lot of fruits and uh, so it's uh, beans a lot of beans and so that's actually it, it is a shame however because we are losing that uh, advantage the diet is changing yeah. we we even in Italy we have now fast food we have super size our kids are getting obese uh, the portions are getting bigger desserts are getting bigger and bigger and so we kind of losing the advantage you know the, the, the Mediterranean diet is a diet of poor people that's true farmers peasant work work the land hard and then they could eat a lot of calories because they spend a lot of calories now in in, in urban centers you you all the, the physical movement has changed cars uh, dishwashers no more fields to work and therefore yeah. you need to be much more careful about the amount of food that you but it's funny to me because if I look at the, what I know about the Mediterranean diet and what I see that we sell now as Mediterranean that there is a huge difference yeah it is <laughs> because funny. As I, it's not really because it is supersized portion yeah, it's got yeah. a lot more process to it and I come from my family comes from Italy also southern Italy and when my grandmother came over to Ellis Island what they put on her um, her uh, I guess the visa to get into Ellis Island was her occupation was peasant <laughs> and that was true she was a peasant and we ate what we call peasant food yeah. so we ate escarole and beans yeah. and everything with whatever bean you could have a legume because that was the diet that was of the, the major southern, source of protein of southern Italians it's a very interesting not anymore though so it's no. going to be interesting to look going forward yeah no tiramisu or uh... yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, I, I want to switch gears for one last question before we wrap up today because an area that you've been really very interested in and is very important and a lot of people don't understand is the relationship between oral health and your overall health um, can you talk about the relationship with gum disease? I know people are usually terrified of even going to dentists, so they don't even know if they have gum disease. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is obvious. Something that has been a relatively recent interest of mine was fascinating me because as a very high prevalence, very large number of people after a certain age have gum disease or gum problems or periodontal disease. So if there is a link between what well, oral health and general health, the, the, the high prevalence of this, of this exposure, of this disease, makes it an important public health problem. And so, uh, basically, if you have gum disease or periodontal health, you have, an you have an inflammatory disease. So inflammation can cause all sorts of changes in the bloodstream, uh, different levels of proteins, uh, other substances that can actually not only damage the mouth but can go from the mouth and the bloodstream and therefore they can affect the kidney they can affect the heart they can affect all sorts of things so um, my main interest has been on the link between in, uh, in inflammation and an infection and therefore the oral health part and heart disease and actually just reviewed uh, I was I was a member of an expert panel that was was uh, uh, organized by the American Heart Association to review the old evidence. And so we found actually that there is a very consistent link. People with periodontal disease have higher rates of heart disease. Hmm. And uh, we don't have, re you know, what we, what we say, is th this is just, uh, we only observe the association. Right, so you don't know chicken don't, or egg, you don't know exactly. if it causes we don't know, it. Or, or if it causes it because right. what happens is that people with periodontal disease are usually uh, less well off or poorer, and there is there is a gradient of right. heart disease with with the, with the income or poverty. But however, even the studies that have connected or uh, adjusted for this show a link. So there is a fairly evidence. There is about 20, 30 percent increase. Now, what we need to figure out is is this: can we affect the risk of disease by 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 preventing or by treating periodontal health? And this is the next step. Right, I, which is very important. And I think it's also very important for our audience to know that 
really you need to get dental checkups. Correct. And it's usually like the last thing people do because it's also very expensive. Very expensive. And, and usually not, not, not covered, covered by insurance. insurance. And mm -hmm. so again, it's another real clinical issue for underserved areas and underserved population and people who don't have the socioeconomic advantage of being able to write a check for a few hundred dollars. But it is important because the earlier you detect it, you can treat it, like and it said. may have implications for later on other diseases that can happen. Uh, and it's, you know, it's usually it's, it's been seen as an aesthetic issue, you know. You're losing right. your teeth, you don't want to lose your teeth, but they may much much more than that. Much, and not only on heart disease, as I said, kidney disease, there is potential link with kidney functioning disease, uh, diabetes, uh, uh, some, some studies have linked uh, periodontal health to actually uh, um, uh, the, um, the outcome of pregnancy, smaller babies, uh, premature babies, because basically the, the theory is that if you have this inflammation and these inflammatory markers access the bloodstream, then once they move around the body, they can cause all sorts of happens. It's really, it's such an important issue to bring up. And I also putting another plug for Sophie. I think we have five students who joined us who Correct. are pre-dental this year, right? Correct. And so they will be doing a several years of their education here. And then I believe they're going to Columbia. They're going to Columbia for the last two years. For the last two years of dental school. So we will be producing dentists as well as physicians. And we should Columbia. not forget, in addition to physicians, we actually educate uh, physician assistants. We have a, a very, very strong uh, nationally uh, recognized and uh, well-known uh, physician assistant program. And uh, the physician's assistants also known for short as PAs. PAs. We're graduating another class this yeah. week. And, and, and we just found out that on their national uh, test, they did above the average. So we yeah. are... We have great students great all so. around. So I can't thank you enough for oh, coming and joining pleasure. us today. I know it's been... Uh, very interesting to me. I always learn something when I'm talking to you, and I usually talk to you about school matters, so it's fun to talk about health matters and, and you as a physician, not only as an administrator. So again, thank you, Dr. Trevisan, for talking to us today on WHCR um, City Talk. The show was produced by WHCR's general manager, Angela Harden. Special thanks to WHCR's production manager, Tina Dixon. Thank you, Tina, for operating the broadcast board. And I am your host, Dr. Lisa Cueco, president of the City College of New York. Have a great day and stay warm. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. You don't have to travel downtown for Italian cuisine in an elegant atmosphere. Grand Piazza di Oro now has a full